Okay, everybody. Well, welcome to uh, Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival for 2022. And also hello to all those people watching on Zoom from their homes or uh, local libraries. Today we're gathered on Gadigal land and uh, to share our stories and our knowledge. And I'd like to pay my respect to Elders past and present and to any First Nation people that might be in the audience. Um, before we get started, there has to be some housekeeping. Um, make sure your phones are switched on silent. Uh, you can take photos, but you can't record. And I know there's, that's a little bit ironic with me saying you can't record on your telephone, if you know anything about it. <laughs> Let's not laugh at me, let's laugh at Graham. <laughs> Um, and I've also been told you can share photos on social media, not that Graham and I know much about that, but that Bad Crime Sydney, hashtag Bad Crime Sydney 22. And in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, if Graham and I turn on each other, um, you leave via the front door, out through the cafe, into a form up point in the domain. So, Gary Jubilant's my name, and I'm very excited and somewhat nervous to be sitting down today talking to a uh, real live former standover man, notorious gangster, Graham Henry. And uh, boy, has he had a life. Um, some of the things that uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about, I just put a little warning out there, it's fairly uh, raw and fairly honest, but uh, if you're true crime buffs and you wanna find out what organised crime is, you're at the right place today. So let's uh, first of all welcome Graham Henry to uh, the Writers Festival. Thank you very much. Now, Graham, 20 years ago, you and I sitting at a writers' festival talking. <laughs> did you see it? Because I luck. didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think the uh, the relationship with a, a cop and uh, a, let's well, let's call it for what it is—a gangster. You're a gangster. Yeah, is right. that that's a, yeah, hundred percent. Okay, we knew there were certain things. Like if I'm sitting down talking to Graham. I probably wouldn't waste my time walking in there and uh, you know, trying to uh, stand over him. I, I pretty much know what he was going to say and it, it wasn't going to be nice. Oh. But uh, we're here about to talk about Graham's uh, book, Last Man Standing. I think it's a very uh, apt title given the amount of times that uh, people have tried to, uh, let's say, what did he say in the underworld? Eliminate or take you out? Yeah, take you out, assassinate. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've had 20 attempts. So. How many attempts? 20 attempts I've had on my life. Yeah, you you think that would you be slightly paranoid? I would be slightly paranoid if I had. Um, I would never call it paranoia. I was, uh, I think, paranoia is fear. I, I, I don't think I was ever. Uh, you know, and it sounds like I'm, I'm bridging up here a bit, but uh, I didn't really ever feel that fear. Uh, it was more an awareness I had of all of my surroundings, and uh, I was always just on the ball and a little bit of ahead of. Uh, the people that were always trying to take me out. So, well, in the in the world that you lived, I, I can imagine that you needed those skills. But what we're going to talk about too, and I just want to point out because when we do talk about Graham's life, and I don't want people to under, uh, misunderstand, we're not glorifying crime here. And I think the huh. best person to explain that is a quote from uh, Graham's book, and I'll just read that out. Yeah. And uh, so this is a quote from from the book, Last Man Standing. I hope if a few young louts read my book, it will turn them off ever living in the world of crooks. I've made some great friends, but I've also met some real life, low life scum. Believe me, in the fast lane of organized crime, the world is very different place from where you live now. Take a tip from someone who has traveled down the hard road, pick another career. 100%. <laughs> that, so you look back at your life, Graham. Yeah. Um, I know there was a, a, a tough upbringing to start with. Yeah, I had a pretty uh, tough uh, upbringing uh, as far as you know, uh, my father was a returned soldier uh, from the Second World War, was very violent, uh, was actually put on painkillers called Fenobarb, and uh, instead of the morphine, when he was in war, he got injured, and they uh, remained on those until 1977 when he uh, committed suicide, he killed himself, and uh, he was... Um, once he was on those, it was like he was tripping. They actually barred him in 1974 because of the uh, hallucinogenic uh, effects they had on people. So mixed with the alcohol that he drank, he, did, he wasn't a really a big beer drinker. He was more the plonk. Uh, as a young bloke, he got on the methylated spirits with tomato sauce. He used to light, light the flames first and mix it with tomato sauce. And, uh, you know, then he brutalised me mother and... And uh, I watched him brutalise her from a kid. I mean, he didn't just slap her 
or pull her hair. He punched her up like she went. Like, I promise, I don't want. Yeah, and, and uh, when when you think about a uh, you know a start in childhood like that, the house is meant to be a safe place, and and you get that. And I've sat down and we've had some long conversations, Graham and I, and it, it gives you a sense of yeah, you know, it gives you a warped view on uh, yeah, you know, the way the world world is. So you might get an understanding that certainly comes out in the book, uh, and it's not making an excuse, but it's just understanding what happened. Yeah. Graham grew up in the same area I grew up. He was about 10 years ahead of me, and uh, he actually terrorised me um, when my childhood, uh, when you're in the gang, the Sharpies. The Sharpies. The, tell us about the Sharpies. Well, the Sharpies were, uh, like, virtually came from an English gang, really, uh, before those skinhead ones come out. And uh, they were actually called Sharpies because of the way they dressed, you know, three-quarter coats, slip-on shoes, which I still wear today. And... Uh, Usually we had no socks, which is a trend now, and uh, short, real short hair, and uh, you know they dressed very snappy, you know, and um, uh, and that's where they got the name from, the Sharpies. So yeah, there was gangs and gangs of them in from you know all over Australia. There was well in those days there were Sharpies, long hairs, surfies, or rockers. So that was it. Yeah, and I always enjoyed my time at the School of Arts dance when the Sharpies turned up. It was good. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. <laughs> One of our favourite fighting halls. Yeah, yeah, it was always good. Yeah. Oh, look, who's turned up? Um, you wanted to be, uh, and uh, again, in, in your book, and I'll keep referring yep. to the book, because if you want a deep understanding of the world of, of organised crime, the underworld, this is it. This is the man sitting beside me that's lived and breathed it for a very long time, and he's survived it. So... Why did you want to become a gangster? Because you wanted, yeah. You know, we all have career, you know, dreams. Yeah. Graham's was to become a gangster. Yeah. Well, I thought so. I was either that or a racing car driver. So, and I, I think, well, the only police my mother and I ever had that I can recall was my father had always on a Friday night go down to the local pub, and uh, we used to watch the Untouchables, and uh, we used to sit there, and that was the best bit of police we had. So. I'd sit there and watch that. Well, she loved Elliot Ness, the cop. And, uh, of course, I liked the crooks. And, uh, you know, and so I virtually knew, honestly, I can even still remember getting off a bus one day. I can remember the day it happened. And I said, that's what I'm going to be. I already knew where I was going to travel. And I didn't care that I was travelling down that road because I seemed to be pretty good at what I was doing, you know. And I don't say that to be, you know, think I'm uh, something out there. But... I was I was a brilliant thief. I could get into places. I learned off older people. When I say older people, I'm talking blokes about 40 who took me on board as a young bloke and uh, I used to go and do a lot of jobs for them and uh, they taught me about burglar alarms and all that. So I was sort of a well ahead of me time, especially with the other young blokes that I ran with. So um, out of about 50 that knocked around Epping in those days, the Sharpies that terrorise your life, uh, there was about 10 of us that uh, uh, became uh, like crooks of a night, you know, and we'd run around doing our things and uh, bro doing burglaries and uh, breaking enters into big factories, mainly factories. Cause I didn't ever want to chase small stuff and be carrying TVs out of people's homes. I'd rather carry a truckload out of the you know, so, so that's how I thought about things. And, you know. and this is starting to give you a sense. This is the life of crime. Like, let's not the, the play around here. This is how do we make some money through crime? And, and we're hearing stories now from, from Graham that I think, yeah, it's fascinating. I find it fascinating. I was a cop for 34 years, but I still find it interesting hearing these stories. But from a very early age, you became somewhat of a standover man and a, a feared figure. Yeah, uh, right. well, I had what, this what, massive... What happened there? I don't know. I just had this massive reputation that uh, was, uh, I mean, I can remember walking into pubs at, at 17 and that, and they used to play that black Superman because my nickname was Abo and, and uh, it used to be pretty embarrassing sometimes, you know. I mean, so, uh, sometimes I probably reveled in the glory of it, you know, you know, as a young bloke would. But um, I, I don't know. It was because I could, you know, I could street fight. I could... Um, you know, I learnt to fight. I've been fist fighting my father since I was 13, trying to protect my mother who only had one leg. So I, um, you know, I just learnt the hard way, I guess. And I, I, I never ever went around picking me mark. 
I can never ever say that. I've never done that there. I've never done it in the prison system. I've never been a bully that way that I, I look for someone to, to look good against. Uh, I just thought whoever wanted to take me, take me there, you know, so. Yeah, well, that that was the reputation he had on, on the street, literally, that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't to be messed with. And uh, we can't condone violence, but there is one funny story. And I just dropped this on you. You, you did tell me this story when uh, your car broke down and you were hitchhiking and the bloke, <laughs> Bloke, some poor blokes picked him up and decided to uh, start talking about. Uh, and I just, sorry, I yeah. digress. Yeah. Just Graham Abo Henry. That's what you know him as, ov for obvious reasons. Where yeah, the world has changed, and uh, yeah, that uh, surname, uh, that uh, nickname doesn't really cut it anymore. But yeah. there's an interesting story about your Aboriginal heritage. We'll try and get That's onto right. that. But this story, it just it broke me up. And I, again, I don't know. I'm laughing at violence, but. Tell us a story when your car broke down and the bloke Yeah, well, up. I was, um, you know, by this time I was running around and I was earning plenty of money and I, I drove a uh, XJS Jag and uh, it was virtually brand new and it just uh, broke down on me at West Ride one day. And uh, so I went, it, I took it into a garage and said, what's wrong with it? He said, oh, it's just an electrical fault. I'll get it fixed up for you. And I said, well, what time are you ready? He said, oh, about three or four o'clock this afternoon. So it was only early in the day, so I decided I'd, I'd hitchhike up to Epping uh, to the hotel and have a couple of beers and wait until it was all done. So as I was hitchhiking up from the back of Eastwood, a bloke picked me up in this utility and we're driving along and he said, where are you going to? I said, the Epping pub, mate, and have a drink. He said, oh, that Abo Henry drinks up there, doesn't he? I went, oh. I said, yeah. I said, well, he used to. I said, he's in prison, actually. So... So next one, he opened up and he started uh, bagging him and tell, telling me how he bashed him up down the side of the laneway. And I said, oh, yeah, what brought that on? Oh, he was bound, we were playing billiards one night and he did the wrong thing, put the cue over my head, so I took him outside in the lane and beat the crap out of him. I said, well, you don't have to worry about him now, mate. He's not there. So I said, why don't you just pull up here? And I said, I'll buy you a beer for giving me a lift up here. He said, yeah, good as gold. And anyway, so we walk up into the bar and the first thing the barmaid had said to me, little aunt, she said, uh, yes, Abba, what do you want, Dar? Well, well, he looked at me and went as wide as a ghost and so I just belted him. I just, <laughs> just knocked him straight out in the bar. So uh, that was a true story. Okay, so. now stop it. We shouldn't be laughing at violence, no, but that, that particular right. one is yeah. quite, uh, that, quite that, uh, that's funny. That's a true so, story. There yeah. was quite a few of them, actually. Karma can be a shit sometimes, can't it? <laughs> but uh, anyway, you've got into uh, more serious crime. When was your first time in jail? Uh, when I was 18, my 18th birthday. I was standing on the station at Epping. Police pulled up. The detectives charged me with blocking a thoroughfare, vagrancy. Uh, and some other charge. You know, I went to court and the judge gave me three months. So I went straight to Parramatta Jail and uh, and uh, that was the 1969. And so. pa Parramatta Jail in those years was a pretty rough place. How was it for you as an 18-year-old? Well, I, I, I actually got on real well in there and they were like the end of the school blokes there. You know, they're, like they used to be all training centres, like Long Bay was a training centre. Then... If for a first time, and then second time you'd go to Goulburn Jail, third time you'd go to Baffus, and the end of the road was Parramatta Jail. You know, so they were all the old safe crackers and the old gangsters from the 30s and the 40s, and the, and uh, I actually got on well, well with them. You know, old Chow Hayes and that, who everyone would have heard about in the old days, and um, I, uh, yeah, I got on well with them, and then after that. You know, I did a few few more stints, but... Is, is it like that we, those of us that haven't been to jail, it, like we understand that it's like a university and you make your connections there? You wanted to be oh, a gangster. No, You're in sure. there and I'm sure you would have made connections in Oh, there. for sure you do, you know, and uh, that's when I met my uh, partner in crime and, you know, when I really got involved in the organised crime world with police protection and... Um, uh, you know, from right up the top, all the way down the bottom, down to the blue, the blue coppers in blue walking around the street and on the beat. And um, I met uh, Arthur Stanley Natty Smith in there in 1973, uh, who's now deceased. And uh, he became my partner for uh, about 10 years from 75 to 85. 
That's uh, uh, and I'm I'm sure people know Nettie Smith and you you mentioned Graham Henry, Nettie Smith and uh, Roger Rogerson and you've probably seen the uh, show Blue Murder and that's where yeah that reputation really built. But yeah. you had a funny uh, relationship with Nettie. There was times that you showed me a location where you were going to kill him and at yeah. some stage he was going to kill you. That's correct. Talk yeah. about the, now, well, this, is, this is a world of crime. Yeah. Let me tell you, it's a different world from what we uh, we understand. Well, you live with, you know, there's big egos in that world, you know, and, um, and uh, Ned had one of the biggest. And uh, I actually organised the crimes and I used to say to him, you're too big, even though you've got help from the police. You just kept the police. I'll organise the crimes. And, uh, and you just stay in the background and you'll get your part. And, uh, but no, he, didn't, he wanted to play a part, so that was fair enough. And, uh, but at the end of the day, when I, I really put the gang together, he didn't have a gang. And no one really wanted to talk to him because he'd already taken a bloke down a lane way on behalf of the police and had him shot dead. So... He had a pretty bad reputation, but his story to me, and I'd known him since he was 75, since 1975 and before, uh, that, you know, he just uh, did, did a favour and just thought they were going to take some money off him uh, down the lane way, which they did anyway. But uh, the truth was that he took him down there knowing quite well that he was going to be murdered, and then he gave evidence on his behalf, um, uh, Detective Roger Rogerson. So... But Ned had been an informer since 1975 when he was pinched at the Fielders Baker robbery, uh, long before, long before anyone ever thinks he was. And uh, his mate got 13 years for an armed robbery, and uh, Roger Rogerson got up in court and gave evidence on his behalf, and and Ned walked out. And of course, once again, he told me he just paid him. So you know, when when, when you're mates with someone over the years, and you know, well, you, you get to believe them. You just trust them, you know, and just say, yeah, all right. Well, fair enough. You know, I mean, I always had my suspicions, but in all those years I run with him, I never saw him give anyone up. Or, you know, there was all these stories he was, but it didn't ever come out really until later when the ICAC started and he went to the National Crime Authority and he gave everyone up. So... So, so on this too, and when when Graham talks about police corruption, I sit here as a, a ex cop, and I, I sort of go, oh, "It's," but that was the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not, oh, yeah. we're not reinventing history. There were people caught out for it, the Royal Commissions, and all all yeah. that. And uh, Graham said something to me, and it, it, it resonated, and it was referenced to it in the book, "What Organised Crime Is." And uh, yeah, you think organised crime? I think most people would think, "Okay, let's look at a bikey group." You got the uh, yeah sergeant at arms you've, you've got the leader and you've got all these other things linked in there you tell us about your uh, yeah. your view of organized crime oh well my, my, you know i mean they, that's what they call organized crime today because you've got no one else to call it but but um you know organized crime to me was having the powers that be on side uh having the police on side just like the mafia having judges having police prosecutors uh, all of these people we had in our pocket and the reason why they all had a weakness, you know, uh, like Rex Bucket Jackson, who was a uh, prison minister, you know, he was a bad gambler, so he became an easy target. I actually paid him and got out of jail early because, uh, I, you know, I, I knew who to see to get me out. Um, and that was the network we had. To me, it was like a giant octopus with arms going out into every part of society to suck all the knowledge and information up we could and and used it against them. And really, that was organised crime. We could do what we liked, you know, and I mean what we liked. And, uh, you know, I walked around with a gun every day of my life. The police knew I did. Uh, police would never pull me up. If, if they did and they went through my boot and I had $200,000 in the boot, I'd say, that's, a, that's for someone higher up than you, mate. You don't want to go there. So they, they'd know in those days the police... No, that'd be right, you know, because they check up on me over the phone. They just say, leave him alone. And that's what they do. And that was because we ran under the umbrella of Ned Smith, who had the green light off the police. And so there was about 10 or 15 of us in that gang. And, well, and we could do as we please. Now, now on, on that too, and I, I sit here and, and I hear that and I don't, uh, I, I'm, I 
no, I don't doubt uh, Graham what he's saying because it's uh, it's documented, it's recorded. But uh, I just got to throw one thing out for the police. There were some straight police too. Yeah, a couple. Okay. <laughs> I think, I, think, I, I, I think he said a couple of thousand. Anyway, it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, there wasn't too uh, many, I'll tell you. I uh, mean, in some way, look, just to cut you short there for a sec, they all, if they didn't cooperate with the detectives or write something in their notebooks about you and they were in another room, they'll say, you heard that conversation, yes, just write it in your book. You know, and that had come out in evidence and they'd, so they'd fabricate you and, and that's how they sunk you and sent you to jail. And uh, look, in those times, there was, and it, it sounds ridiculous now, but uh, unsw- unsworn statements uh, that uh, I could interview uh, Graham and he refuses to sign a statement, but I could make contemporaneous notes and go to court and say, this is, this is what he said. Yeah. It's not accepted now. Um, it was a, yeah, a, a right. practice back in the day, good, bad and uh, in, indifferent. But that, that is yeah. the world. And that's when we sit here speaking that, you know, it's walking, talking history in terms of what uh, what we've seen in Sydney. And we've always had a reputation for the underworld, and this is a man that's uh, been uh, in there right deep. Tell us about um, uh, an, one attempt on your life when you went to the unit, and I think it was uh, Christopher Flannery. Yeah, that was uh, Mr. Renticule from Melbourne. Uh, that was his nickname. Uh, we actually nicknamed him that. And uh, like he was a good a, nickname. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, gun for hire. And... Uh, Anyway, he, uh, he, I actually met him in prison. I met him before uh, uh, Ned or anyone else knew him and he'd been extradited from Melbourne uh, up here to Sydney over the murder of a bro- brothel keeper. And uh, anyway, he beat the charges and uh, he started to work up here. Well, we'd heard about him running around up here with uh, George Freeman and Lenny McPherson, who were the older gang than us, who'd were the ones who were the real first organised crime gang in this city, and uh, and the, and, the, and they run the ruled the roost for thirty years, from the late fifties right through until late seventies when when we really took over because they'd lost all their powers. Everything became legal then, you know, uh, you know brothels, uh, gambling. So you know, that, TAB, that, so. that had an impact on it. Oh, what, what massive, they were running. massive, and and you know, and there's rumours going round like the Bob Bottom will tell you. Um, uh, you know, that uh, they were involved in the drug trade and that was untrue. Uh, they wanted nothing to do with drugs, that gang. And uh, they were at the old school. Uh, they, you know, they just did the standover stuff. And, yeah, they committed many murders, but it was against other people who wanted to live in that life and knew the rules. And, and if you broke them, you pay the penalty. It, and they, um, and it, it's, it's not acceptable, obviously, but that was the way of it. That uh, the gangsters, there used to be that war going on, and someone had disappeared. What we're seeing in Sydney now is different, where you're seeing it done very publicly. There were some public killings around Graham's time and the talk, time he's talking about, but yeah. quite often someone had just disappeared. Oh so yeah, that that would be uh, problem problem solved. But that's when, uh, as I say, Flannery uh, decided that you know he was working for them, and then he Ned came to me, and Ned was a pretty much a terrible liar sometimes. And uh, he'd always loved to draw me into whatever was going on, even if I wasn't even mentioned. So he'd, um, he rang me up one night and uh, we both lived up the coast, up around uh, Lake Macquarie. And we used to come down to Sydney three or four days a week and let the gang do the rest of the work the rest of the week. So um, he called me up this night and he said, uh, I want to see you. So I met him down at Warner's Bay on the water and about two o'clock in the morning and he said, Oh, that uh, Chris Flannery he said, you know him, don't you? I said, yeah, I know him well, know where he lives. And he said, um, he wants to kill you and me. I went, why would he want to kill me? And I said, I know him well, I've never done nothing wrong. He said, that's what he's telling everyone he wants to. So he really did want to take over. Um, and, and he thought just by killing anyone with a reputation, that was his way to the top of the underworld. Well, you know, you had to have a little bit of smarts to go with it. With it. So unfortunately, he didn't have that. And uh, so what he did, he um, he came and started running around with us. So Rogerson put on a meet. Instead of us going straight to his house, which I wanted to do, I said, we'll go down, I'll knock on his door and I'll pull him out the front of his house. So he, and Ned said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, we'll go down to my girlfriend's place where he always liked to hold office, where I used to sit there like a dummy. I wouldn't talk in the house, I wouldn't talk in my car, I wouldn't 
you know. So I'd just listen and then I wouldn't talk until I got outside somewhere and was walking. And so we got there and he said, um, I need to call Rogerson. I said, what do you want to call him? I said, I'll call him after. I said, we'll go and sort the bloke out now, then we'll call him after. And he said, no, I'll go and call Roger. So he goes up, calls Roger. He said, and tells him straight over the phone, he said, that Flannery wants to kill me and have a... And he said, right, I'll meet you this afternoon at the Foster's Hotel. I'll bring him along with you, with him. So we turn up at the Foster's Hotel right in the middle of the city in uh, the be beginning of Kent Streets there. And uh, and he said, um, anyway, in come Chris. And he said, g'day, Abba, how are you, mate? I said, yeah, good, Chris. So anyway, he walked over the bar. They're showing Blue Murder, of course, a different scenario. But... Um, Anyway, he uh, walked over to the bar and uh, Ned Smith said to him, I believe you want to kill me. Left me right out of the equation all of a sudden. And, uh, and he said, why would I want to kill you? And he said, well, that's what we want to know. So anyway, next minute, they're just sitting there talking to and from with each other for about 10 minutes. And then Rogerson said, why don't you just both become friends and work with each other? I thought, there's no way in the world I'm working with this bloke. So I said to Ned, I pulled him aside and I said, you put him in any, anywhere near our team. I said, I'm gone. So I knew he was a toe cutter and a backstabber and, uh, and he'd kill his own mother. You know, he's one of those type of blokes. So I said, uh, right. So I walked out that night. They ended up talking about, you know, the people they'd shot. I thought, you know, there's a big note in competition going on here. So I left. So I wasn't into that sort of talk and I didn't want to hear it. So left anyway not long after it there was a few few big incidents that happened in sydney that caused these things to take place this murder attempt on me uh, quite a few murder attempts uh four four from this gang nettie smith's gang and um where it involved christopher dale flannery and another bloke called laurie prentigast who actually came from melbourne as well both have gone missing and uh they came up and uh Anyway, they said what had happened, Michael Drury, a police officer had been shot in his house at Chatswood. And uh, the story was it was Christopher Dale Flannery, Flannery who shot him uh, and Roger Rogers and drove him there in a police car and that's the biggest load of rubbish you'll ever hear. Uh, Roger Rogerson and Christopher Flannery were somewhere else to have a backstop and Laurie Prendergast was the man who went and shot him. But I knew all, I was part of these conversations. So before they were going to happen, I was at the back of Christopher Dale Flannery's house one day, much as I didn't want to be there. And we were having this conversation that they were going to shoot this Michael Drury because he'd refused a bribe that Rogerson had given him and uh, made him an offer and he refused it. And he said, no, it's gone too far, the case. I can't, this is over a drug deal in Melbourne. And he said, I can't help you. So... Michael Drury walked away and uh, so I'd come, up come this bloke who hired him. His name was um, Alan Williams, came from Melbourne, another drug dealer from down there. I knew all his family, a terrific family. They all brassed him after this. But uh, anyway, he came up and, uh, and he said to him, look, instead of 50,000, which Flannery usually got for knocking someone, killing someone, uh, he said, make it 500,000 as a police officer. And they knew that he had the money because he was a massive drug dealer. So he said, all right, 500,000 is a deal. So they got $250,000 down between them and 250,000 was going to come at the end of the result. Now, uh, as everyone knows, he was shot that night, he never died. So they needed a scapegoat. And guess who it was? Me. So because I'd sat down with these conversations, I told them they were a bunch of lunatics for even thinking about it. And I said, because it's going to bring the house of cards down that we've built. And uh, that's just probably the silliest business idea I've ever heard. You, you get a sense how treacherous this world is, don't you? Like uh, you hear stories like that and I don't know, like how do you, like you would always have to be, on your guard. Oh yeah, you, you, gotta, you could you, not drop your guard. No, you can't. You can't drop your guard. 
now and I, I lived hot wired all the time i guess you know i was just sort of, you know i know when i stopped it that i i felt like i was depressed you know because i'd i'd been so used to being oh, the peace and you know, serenity yeah how, i how mean depressing. peace and serenity wasn't good for me yeah. um, well, I, you know I, for a while i do understand that like you would be running on adrenaline in that in that world and i think that probably drags you into that world uh, yeah. to, to a degree oh it does but Big yeah there's been you've been shot by you've been shot twice once yeah. by police once yeah, by, once by the police in the head guys yeah and uh and once in the leg that that was uh, at, that was by flannery christopher Dale flannery right okay and uh that was at north sydney where the police shot you that that's was right during, yeah during the rest yeah and, the 12th uh, of june 1981. okay and you did a couple of years after that and then for, um what, the next for, attempt for, for, no for after when they well shot you and the rest yeah. of you. they did both they shot him and the rest of him yeah that's correct yeah he yeah, gave me seven years and uh it was a big big headlines in those days because there was drugs involved and um uh and i'd threatened the life of a undercover police officer and uh they had him taped up so they said he's got to go because that was one of the rules of the organized crime you weren't to hurt any of the police and so because i threatened his life uh, i said if you rob me or rip me off then i'm going to finish you so um i decided they'd let go at me so they did but i woke up to the fact you know to say that awareness i've always had and i threw myself down in the car they said that they you see on blue murder they're coming out of the um out of a shop front window and they trip and the gun goes off and blows out the front window <laughs> well that never happened trust me i jumped straight out of a big ltd uh ford fairlane come straight down beside me stuck it up on the uh, wind, windscreen of the car and just let go so i covered my hands over my face and threw myself backwards and the pellets went all through the top of my skull and and uh, lucky they didn't use the real big shot because it would have blown me head clean off this is um, the world of cops and robbers this is you know, yeah real life this is a, the man that uh, you know if it was down a little bit more maybe you wouldn't be here That's um right. You also had another running with uh, with a cop, and uh, this you ended up serving uh, what seven years for? I've got oh uh, yeah, I've got sentenced to eight years. I probably uh, they're trying to get me life. Uh, that was a wounding of a uh, police prosecutor. His name was Malcolm Spence. Now look, when when we talk about this, uh, and you hear the story, Graham's story on it, you think, well, yeah, this this is heavy. But this is the world that was going on at the time, so yeah. I've. Handler. Well, Malcolm Spence was part of that organised crime circle we had. So if uh, one of you were pinched here and you were a friend of mine and you come and saw me, I'd say, we're, all and, right. So and you, we're, we're just, I, I'm not, yeah. I'm just mindful with what we've got with Mal, whether yeah. there's, he's been charged or convicted of anything. So I just, yeah. if, if we could just go on the basis that he associated with the uh, the group. With, with the, yeah, with the organised crime group. And and okay. then I, I think something got back to you that he was uh, spreading some uh, yeah, yeah, he, you. yeah Yeah, no, he was fishing. He was on a fishing expedition. He came into the hotel, Captain Cook Hotel at the end of Kent Street. Uh, where we all used to drink of an afternoon and uh, and he pulled me aside and he said are you going over to Piermont I said yeah I am I said I'm actually going to Balmain but I'll drop you over there if you want to lift so I drove him over there when we got there there was no one in the pub except the barman and just me and him and next minute he took his teeth out and I went what is this fool doing so and the worst thing to do was to take your teeth out if it's going to make his jaw even worse so I thought what are don't, you doing don't you, lo don't you love you the know, thought process <laughs> i mean you know i mean that's what i was thinking to myself what are you doing so next minute he uh he said you've been to internal affairs and told them that i've i'm driving a style on mercedes-benz i said why would i do that i need you you know why would i do that again where'd you get that from he said ned smith told me i said oh jesus i said well go and get ned and i'll tell you in front of him that's not true and I said, anyway, have a think about what you've said tonight. Put your teeth back in your head. And I said, because I'm going to leave. So I took off. And I said, I'll catch up with you tomorrow. So I went back to the same pub. And he was there with two police, Kenny McKnight and another detective. I can't remember his name now. And I and they said, oh, Graham, don't, don't hit him. And I said, mate, I'm going to more than hit him if he keeps this up. So I walked over and I, because 
the one thing that you had to have in that life was that was that reputation that you you, you never told you didn't you know if you told you you were just gone and uh so you know and i, I lived on that that was my principles so there was no one in the world that i never did that so as it turned out it was a policeman that wrote the statement and they came out later on but it was too late so what had happened anyway i walked into the hotel and uh, and he said mate look uh, i'm sorry about that i uh i was out of school but uh, i still sort of believe it you know and i went I, anyway i walked away i just thought no I've, I've got to leave this i'll have to th have a think about it anyway i brooded on it i brooded on it and i thought about it now it was just near christmas 87 i think and i went to uh i went to pay some police that i owed some money to and i thought this is a christmas drink for them they've been helping me over a few robberies i've done so i i better go and give them a drink don't laugh at him you're encouraging him you know so I went over with a bag full of money and uh, got on the wine. Well, I'd give them wine to me, I'd like give them whiskey to the Indians, you know, an old saying. But um, sorry about that, Indians. But, um, you know, I, um, I just couldn't handle it. You know, I was good on the beer. And uh, anyway, I walked out of the place, got into an argument with a bloke, had nothing to do with me. He just come out and stuck his head into me. And... I offered him out down the road and he said, uh, no, no, I'm not, I don't go that far on my picnic. Well, I just wanted to get him out of the pub and just down the back in the park, he wouldn't come. So anyway, I just drove off and left him, but I left in a bad mood and instead of going where I was going to go, which was just up the road and stay the night, sleep it off and then go back up the coast the next day, I decided to go to Five Dock and find me a uh, gang over there. Had a drink with them over there. Then we went to Surrey Hills, a drink with a few police officers. And then I said, right, are we going home? So on the way home, I drove down Bullwarra Road, Oldermo. And if anyone knows the street, it's only a one-way street, very, very narrow. They park both sides of the street. So you've got to drive slow down there anyway. So I drove down there. And as I'm driving down there, here's Malcolm Spence. So my mates just looked at me like that and went, oh, no. I went, yep, tonight's the night. So I walked in there. All I was going to do was build him. So I walked in there and I tapped him on the shoulder and he had a big ring of people around him. And they called him Big Brother because Big Brother's always looking over you. And that's what he did to us in the, in the, in the court of law. Right? So, so I walked in, tapped him on the shoulder and I said, outside, I want to have a talk to you. And he said, uh, oh, I don't go, I'm not going out there. I'm not talking shop tonight. I said, yes, yeah, come on, out here. So I walked outside and as I'm, I looked back and he followed me. I thought, he's a silly man, this one. So we got up in the laneway. It was very dark, no street lights. I hit him on the chin and just whacked him again and down he went. So next minute he got up and he started having a bit of a, a sook to me and i just lost it and i pulled out a knife and i stabbed him in the stomach and then i stabbed him in the throat and uh he had a polo neck jumper on he went down of course and when he got up by this time someone in the pub had said oh he's gone outside with abo henry and we're a bit concerned about him so next minute an ambulance pulled up the police pulled up and i was still standing there so I, I was thinking to me, I didn't even know if I'd even got him, you know, because he had this massive big polo neck jumper on that was as thick as anything. It was winter. No, it wasn't all summer, but he had this polo neck thing on. And so he didn't even realise it until he got down the hospital. When he got down the hospital, he said, this man's assaulted me. So I was arrested straight away, went down to the police station. And uh, next minute they come in, they said, we're going to have to charge you with malicious wound, Graham. He found out he was stabbed and he fainted on the spot when he realised what had happened to him when they showed him the wounds. And uh, I'd only just missed his juggler vein. So, I, boy, I met, boy, you know, just a smidgen. So he was extremely lucky and so was I. You, you, uh, you ended up doing... I, I got an eight-year sentence over it and... Uh, 
the only reason being the judge actually turned around and said, as far as I'm concerned, it's two criminals that were meeting in the lame way because so much stuff all of a sudden that was hidden about him surfaced. And I said, oh, no, you can't use that because it might have upset another gang and, you know, put me in a bad position. So... I, and so, uh, just on on that, I, uh, I, that's why I've got eight years. Yeah, I, I've spoken to Graham about it, and uh, it was almost a turning point in your life. Like you, you regretted that, and you're eight years away from your family, yeah, well, I, and you're a mug on on do, doing that because of escalation. Oh, I was, fil- yeah. I was filthy on myself for doing it, and uh, you know because you know, but all I wanted to do was just. Knocking down, you know, and even the, even the detective said to me, mate, if you would have done that, we, we, we know what he's like, he's a pain in the ass. So, um, but you know, he, de- he thought he was a gangster, this bloke, and that was the way he dressed. He had the gold chains on, he had the slip on shoes, he drove every car that we drove, he drove. So, he was one of those type of blokes. So, as I say, he was part of that connection, and he knew that you don't speak out of school about anyone like that unless you really have facts. And uh, unfortunately, you know, if it, if it was a criminal, well, it would have been worse. I wouldn't have just stopped there. You know, I would have killed him. So now that's uh, that is you're getting these stories, and there's a hundred stories. And uh, yeah, I, again, go to the book if you want the the full stories on uh, on the life of a gangster. Graham, your your life now, you've uh, you've gone on the uh, straight and narrow. Yeah, I gave it away in 2010. You're not uh, a choir boy, but you're... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 boy, no stretch of the imagination. But I, but I, uh, you know, I mean, you can't change your spot. You are what you are. Um, you know, I, but I live a... Pr- look, you know, if you ask my children, they'd just think I was the biggest pussy cat you've ever met. But, you know, uh, they, they, they've never, never seen me. They, they just know that if I get angry, they say my eyes go yellow. So... <laughs> So they know I've never hit them, I've never struck them. I've, I think I've hit my daughter once on the backside when she was about 12 for giving me some lip. Uh, uh, that's the worst I've ever done. I've never, certainly never ever touched my wife. I've been married 49 years and uh, still love her to death and uh, she's got cancer at the moment. And, uh, but um, no, we've certainly lived through it. And, uh, but look, I gave it away in 2010 and I sort of, as I said before, my, my anxiety levels went to a different scale. So next thing I felt depressed. I felt, you know, all, all, I started getting paranoid feelings. And then, so I went to this bloke who was in North Sydney and he was a kinesiologist and they, they do this thing called NET. And it was brought out for uh, the Vietnam veterans to de-stress them. And it just works on your conscious. And he used to just hold your arm up. He'd ask you questions about things and your arm would just drop and he'd just walk away and say, what happened at the age of seven? What happened to you at 15? Well, I got raped in boys' home. That's what happened to me. So, and he'd do something again. He'd fix me up and he'd ask me again and it'd be as strong as anything. So, and I learnt, and that rape that happened to me, and I got raped for eight days straight. Um, that's what turned me. It turned me into that violent bloke that I was. And, uh, you know, and I was extremely violent. And I, I make no bones about that, you know. I've, I've hurt a lot of people, but I've never hurt anyone outside of that circle. Um, I just lived in that life. That was my life. But that event there... Uh, changed the course of the direction of my life for sure. I did try and work. I uh, worked as a bouncer. I worked as a um, uh, carded bricks, carded meat, carded pianos. I did all that sort of heavy stuff. And then I just looked at the, and I said, oh, no, this is ridiculous. I was a professional fighter. And then I just thought to myself, I'm getting $49 for four rounds of, uh, of uh, fighting here. You know, when I can jump across that counter there and go and grab eighty thousand, hundred thousand. Or, there's another you know. thing Graham probably doesn't want to talk about, but uh, he 
also could have and almost had a career as a singer. He's a very good singer. And uh, he uh, even dabbled in the modelling thing. So yeah, it could yeah. be a, a completely yeah. different Graham. But yeah, the, that's right. It's funny the, the paths lives take. But I, I think sitting down, and what I'm enjoying since I've left the cops, is, is sitting down, speaking to people like Graham, getting a bit of an understanding of where they're coming from. And, you know, you've just got an insight into who this person is. It's raw, it's honest, but that's like the world that uh, Graham inhabited. Now, I'm conscious of the time, so uh, have we got any questions from the audience? One straight away. You've been hanging on to that one. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Henry. That's all right. Um, you've knocked about with some of the, I guess, most infamous names in Australian crime history. And many of them, you know, basically ended up either disappeared like Chris Flannery or died in jail like Lenny McPherson or Nettie Smith or yep. are in jail like Roger Rogerson. That's right. How did you manage to survive, you know, the criminal life? And how do you, how did you support yourself once you gave it away? Well, the first question. Just, just think about this before you answer yeah. it. I might. Uh... The first one, first one may be a little bit difficult. Um, I just did the best I could and stayed on top. And as I said, I was an extremely weird person. I've always had this psychic ability. Uh, my mother had it, my daughter's got it. No one else in the family has it. But I know things before they're gonna happen. And those things always warn me. If I ever dreamt of snakes, when I was a kid, I used to have nightmares about snakes. And my mother used to say, what are you dreaming about? I said, snakes. She said, what happened? And I said, I fell into a big pit of them. She said, you're gonna have a lot of enemies. How right she was. And that was passed on to me. And now I saw my first spirit at 13, the first one I ever saw. I've had him sit on the end of my bed. Now, this might sound far-fetched to anyone that's never, ever seen a spirit. But those sort of things, I get visitations. My daughter gets them. Um, she gets them better than I do. She can call them like that. I, it takes me a couple of weeks. But uh, it's those sort of things and the dreams that I used to have that used to make me aware of things that were going to happen to me. And most times they were either a snake or if a dog barked during my sleep, it meant something was going to occur that day. Didn't mean it was going to be dangerous. Just meant someone was going to come past or watch me or, but if I saw a snake in any shape or form, I'd know something was going to, something was going to happen to me. Now, so now I'd always be on guard. So. Now, whether you understand or, or uh, yeah, believe in that, something has kept him alive. <laughs> like, you, you hear that story. I don't know how he stayed alive. Yeah. Uh, uh, some more questions. Yeah. Graham, why, in Blue Mur why didn't Blue Murder tell the full story? Like, yeah. when uh, Rogerson took Flannery to Michael's house in Chatswood, now, I'm not doubting you because yep. you know this lovely book. Yep, I certainly do. Um, and I love him very dearly. Yeah. I was told in regards to Blue Murder, Flannery went to the window and then um, stood there. Michael was actually standing over the kitchen window That's with his child in his hand, yeah. then went back to the car and said to Rogerson, I'm not going to kill Drury. He's holding his child. I've heard, but I'm not doubting you. Yeah, no. I was told Rogerson turned around and said to Flannery, give me the effing gun you see. I'll go and do it. No, absolute rubbish, mate. Yeah. So, uh, and, and look, we would, <clears throat> sorry, Graham, with no. Blue Murder, there's certain things that wouldn't be reported on for legal reasons yeah. and, and all that. So it gets, it gets compl yeah. complicated. But, I, there. but look, I can honestly tell you, mate, that is absolute rubbish. Uh, as I say, I was always part of those conversations. So I know exactly what went down. Um, and, and I only say that because, and nominate them now because they're both deceased. Uh, I know that because I had a visitation of Laurie Prendergast who sat on the end of my bed. So, all right. Uh, I, uh, sorry. That's a true story. Huh? I, I'm just mindful with the time. I see, is this a, I should have glasses, even though I haven't got glasses. This is a question from someone in Zoom land, yeah. I think. Uh, can you just read that out? Yeah. 
Where did you meet your uh, Right, uh, very, very quickly, uh, your yeah. ab- Aboriginal heritage. Yes, well, my Aboriginal heritage. Well, there I was at 14 years of age and all my mates started to call me Sambo and because uh, I had dark skin and I went, where did the Sambo come from, mate? He said, well, you know, have a look at you, mate. You know, Lord, we're as white as snow and you're as black as charcoal. And I said, well, I said, well, Sambo, we're not going to call me. I'm not going to shine your shoes or... You know, so then it would originate and went to Abbo. And that was because, you know, I just said to everyone, I've got skinny legs, got a flat nose. Uh, you know, that's all I thought it was. Anyway, my sister died at 65 of stomach cancer. And uh, when she was dying, she said to me, I need to tell you something. I said I was adopted, right? And she said, no. She said, mum's your mum, but the father that raised you, that used to... Bash mum and bash you and not your father. Your father was Aboriginal. And I said, well, there you go. So I ended up, when I, I actually had a, another daughter to another lady who died, she died, she was a d- type 1 diabetic and she died at the age of 20. And uh, in 1971 she died, 1970 I was in prison and I was going to get out and I was going to marry that girl named name was Julie Schmitzer. And she had a little girl. So when I got out, I started to take the little girl out. She was still alive at this time. And then all of a sudden, she went into a diabetic coma and died. And um, so I tried to get custody of her. And uh, the the court said, under no circumstances are you having her. I thought, well, what do they think I'm going to do? You know, but uh, anyway... So that's what they did. So, but she is so Aboriginal looking, it is unbelievable. And yet when all my other children were having babies, they said to them, are you Aboriginal? And they said, no, because there is white as snow, except for my son, he's dark. And, uh, and they said, well, that's funny. And they said, because you've got a black line that runs from here to there when you're pregnant. And she said, no, the Indigenous people get it. So, you know, we all scratched our head about it and then we found out that that was what I was. And uh, so I've got all my paperwork now. I actually went up to the Awabakal people at um, Newcastle. But, you know, I don't get involved in the politics of it all because it drives me batty. Um, so I was raised white, I think white. But he thought he was Spanish. <laughs> and I thought I was Spanish. Most of it, most I ha- of had a suave sort of yeah, feeling of, to it. A bit of swagger <laughs> about it. Um, we've got time for one more question, I think. Yes? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Hello. Um, I, I was in a pub once and uh, this bloke said to me his mate had been a security guard on, um, you know, armor, armor guard oh, right, yeah. tra- trucks. Yep. And he said what the logic was is that they knew the actual armor guard person who would sit there and listen to when the police were being called, know when the armed robber was going to come, that they would basically, that there was the conspiracy involved actually armor card drivers. Drivers. As well as the actual robbers who knew the right. armor guard drivers, yeah. as well as the police who knew both sets of them, and then would delay the police to arrive, mm. and the armor guard security guards would help them take the cash, and they'd go. It was a, you know, it was helping the public. Graham, and did I'd you go, plan this robbery? I go, I go, I go. How does it help the public? And like the guy just says to me, well, well, we basically they're insured. You know, the guys in the vans don't have a lot of money. They get the money. The cops get the money. The robbers get the money. Nah. Um, the insurance companies pay out and only the rich pay for insurance because they're the only ones that have got money that need to insure. Well, I, well, I can honestly so we just... spread the wealth around. And yeah. I just went, that was... Is that the kind of logic well, that Well, works? look, I believe that has happened on one occasion that someone knew the guard and the guard had put them into it, one here in... In, in New South Wales and one in Queensland. But it never, ever happened in ours. The police never told us anything to do or or got involved in them. All we told them was if we needed their help was to be at a certain location, we're going to rob it that day, and then they'd go down and take over it and the identikit pictures might be. And I'll say that's them there because we didn't worry about disguises. And And if we did have disguises on, they were... Brilliant ones. We didn't pull up with balaclavas and run in like you see the blokes on TV and 
we did things, that, you know, I'd be walking past with a briefcase and next minute I'd just stick one in their head and just say, don't move, drop that, and um, we'd walk away with it. But, but look, of course we had the police and we paid the police 10% of whatever we got. But we've never, ever, I've certainly never, ever been involved in a case where the armour guard was involved. I knew that Nettie Smith was once uh, and he ended up coming unstuck. I think he went to prison over it. And, uh, but look, organised crime doesn't look at things and just say, geez, we're sorry uh, we stole that or, you know, that was just part of our life and everything we did steal was insured. Um, and I can honestly say that in, in all the crimes that I've been, and they know that I was a prolific arm robber, but, and that means that I was successful. I've never been convicted. So you've got to work that one out. That doesn't mean that the police saved me. Can I ask for a confession here, just for old no. time's sakes? <laughs> no. But, but I, you know, I put a lot of homework into what I did. Uh, I made myself that way that I was that disciplined. I had to do what I did and I would never hurt anybody on the job. I wasn't going to take their life or... You know, there's idiots that run around and do those sort of things and shoot them dead and, you know, well, that was never part of my my plan or four day and anyone that was in my team, they didn't follow my rules, they were they were gone. So I've never heard anyone. So uh, do I feel sorry that I robbed them? Uh, not really. <laughs> like, to be honest with you, now, you, know, I, you know, I love the life, unfortunately, and um, I, I, I think I was bred into it and... That was just the way I was. And uh, for people out there, like you want to, yeah, I take it you're interested in Graham's life, the, the fact that you've been here, true crime buffs and all that. This is the realism. I, I, I was walking along with a briefcase, had a gun, I just stuck it in his head, told him, I'll have that. Yeah, that's how, that's how it's done. Yeah, that is what gangsters were about. This is the world. So, yeah, I, I, I find it fascinating. And I, I think we're fortunate. And again, we're not condoning what, what's happened. Or, or what you've done, and I, I don't think you've you've skied in about it either. It's no. it is what it is, and a, a, again, a passage from the book. I think it's probably a, a good way to sort of finish off. I'm not after understanding, exonerating, uh, exoneration, or sympathy. I just want to tell my side and let others decide for themselves because I'm sick of all the bullshit and the lies by the police and criminals alike. Many of you whom have lied in order to get me out of the way. So. That's raw, that's honest, that's, uh, yep. that's coming from Graham. If you're interested in a book, and uh, I've, I've you know, stood over him a little bit, and he said, if you do buy a book, he'll also give you a photo as well. So you can get a photo <laughs> and a signature. I just, you know, I keep him under control. But uh, I, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd just like to thank you so much, Graham, for t taking us all into a that's world right. that we rarely get to see. So uh, no lady, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the book uh, signing, if you're interested in the book, is out in the cafeteria area, that way, I think.